Uh, yes, Larry. My question for Bill Maher is, what are your thoughts on companies such as Merrill Lynch giving out billions of dollars in bonuses despite major losses and then getting billions of dollars in taxpayer bailout money? It seems like we're rewarding bad behavior. Huh, to say the least. Well, I think it's disgusting. I, I'm, I mean, it it's makes me so angry like I think every other American. I mean, that the... And, and, you know, for people who are wondering which approach is correct now, Obama's or what the Republicans in Congress are proposing, it wasn't that long ago. It was only a few months ago that the Republicans were running the show. And this is what happened. You know, just a few months ago, it was Bush and Paulson at the wheel. And what did they do? They gave all this money to the banks, no regulation, no strings, and these guys just basically stole it. Citibank lost $10 billion in a quarter, and they took that as a green light to go buy a private jet. I, I, I mean... You say cancel it. Yeah, they, they let the foxes guard the hen house, and then the foxes ate the hens, and then we gave them money to go eat at KFC. You know, if you're going to start calling people traitors or bring that up, I could I could mention a few people who I think are much more traitorous, beginning with companies that move their uh, operations to Bermuda so they don't have to pay taxes. I mean, we're finding out about Enron and those kind of companies that they basically have been doing for the last, I don't know how many years, what caused that Asian market collapse in the late 90s. Uh, wealthy people did all sorts of ridiculous accounting tricks to hide the money that they were making or not making counting on corrupt politicians who they had bought off to look the other way well that is sort of what's going on here in america now and they're investigating companies that maybe screwed california in absolutely the, in the energy crisis yeah it wasn't a crisis to me this is a lot more traitorous than tom daschle asking hey fellas i'm the leader of the opposition party could i find out where we're going oh, oh the either. bachelor i went all over town on that one because The Bachelor, you know, they had these 25 women who said, well, it is kind of a humiliating thing to do, but we have to because there's no good men out there. Well, that's not true. There's plenty of good men out there. It's just that women have been fed this pandering nonsense from the Oprah, Dr. Phil propaganda machine. We have pandered to their fantasies and their, and their fairy tales. And so uh, they believe that everybody, every guy should be the bachelor. There's a lot of good men out there, but you know, they're plumbers. And Larry, you know, a creature like no other can't marry a plumber. <laughs> She's gotta have Alex. So that show then plays to that common denominator that, but, but aren't the Dr. Phil's and the Oprah's helpful? They care about people. They try to make people I don't better think, than they were. No, I don't think they're helpful at all because I think they, they feed this idea. We, we, somewhere along the line, it became national law that women are spiritual, ethereal, perfect beings and men are brutish louts. And, you know, I feel sorry for the lummox who comes home at 6 o'clock and hasn't been watching Oprah all day and doesn't understand about what he's supposed to be and what men are supposed to be, because he was at work all day. <laughs> you think they're anti-men? I think the country is. I mean, look at all of our culture. It's always head up his ass dad and brilliant mom, who somehow, you know, she treats the husband like one of the children, and somehow she's martyred and put upon, but she gets through the day, even with old dummy on her. <laughs> you know, it's sort of comparable to my situation. We were talking in the break about Chris Rock, and I said he, like me, is somebody who is not afraid to get booed because we are two comedians who enjoy unsettling people's opinions. It's easy to go out there and confirm prejudices. But when a politician does that, Kennedy sending troops into the South in 1963, losing the South, which before then was the solid South, meaning Democratic, for a generation, maybe getting himself killed for it, who knows, certainly he would have had trouble winning the election. Mm -hmm. He would not have won all the southern states again. George Bush, after read my lips, no new taxes, raising taxes because it was the right thing to do. Those are the presidents I admire because they give up what they prize the most, which is election, for the greater good. And you have to do that because it's a very bratty nation mm -hmm. with bratty voters. I do not represent the thoughts of the majority. And that's okay because the majority, to me, is not always that wise. And people have this crazy idea that this country was founded by our founding fathers on the idea of as much input as we can get from the people. Quite the opposite.
Our founding fathers made this a republic and not a democracy because they feared the mob, said the Greeks. They did not think that the mob, not really the mob, but the vast majority, uh, should be that connected to government. That is why they put Washington where it was, away from the financial centers, which is all about what's going on now with campaign finance reform. They never wanted that kind of influence, and they certainly didn't want it from the howling masses. So, you know, when, when people say you don't uh, conform necessarily to the broad mainstream, I say thank you. <laughs> I'll take that as a compliment. I thought it was interesting he, was, he mentioned Darwin, <clears throat> you know. <clears throat> and Born the uh, same day as Lincoln. I think only, I read the other day, I think only four in ten Americans believe in evolution. It's still not a very bright country, Larry. <laughs> and uh, I, I think it was interesting because he, Obama has made the point recently that although politicians are disagreeing about the stimulus package and whether we should spend money, government money now, really economists don't. And it reminded me the way politicians for years when they talked about evolution said, well, people disagree. Yet yeah, people disagree. Scientists don't disagree on evolution. There's a consensus among scientists, just as a, as a consensus really among economists now, that we, government has to spend a lot of money. I, I think, well, first of all, wages have been basically stagnant for 30 years. But this is America. And just because wages are stagnant, <laughs> people didn't think their lives should be. They wanted to continue to have a lifestyle that got better, and so they had to do it on credit. I mean, that's really what happened. And, you know, the idea that we could continue to have this disparity in wealth where the rich got richer and everybody else did not advance at all. Uh, that was always going to be a ship sailing toward an iceberg. If you look at the Bush recovery, you know, from 2002 to 2006, uh, there's something like 800 something billion uh, dollars in increase in wealth. Like three quarters of it went to the top 1%. Um, you know, FDR's uh, Fed chief talked about this during the Depression. He said, when there's an inequality of wealth, it eventually is going to lead to a depression. Because he said it's like a poker game, where more and more wealth goes into the hands of one player, and everybody else has to borrow just to stay in the game. And when their credit runs out, then the game is over. Uh, you know, politicians will always say, if we only had a government as good as the people. Yeah. Well, our big problem is that we do have exactly a government as good as the people. Our, our, our democracy is very representative. I mean, we get to choose these people, and these are the people we put into office. So it does come back to the people. They're, com they're very easily fooled, and they're horribly misinformed about everything. And the people who watch Fox News live in a bubble I can't even describe to you. They have, the facts never get in. It, it's like the airlock in an alien movie, you know, whether you can't let the alien in or else you have to blow up the ship. <laughs> Uh, that's really the situation we have in this country, is, is you, you, you have a hard time uh, passing legislation that means something if people don't understand what's in it. They still don't understand what's in Obamacare. They still don't know what that is, and we passed that three years ago. Well, not a quick fix. I mean, I think it would start with education, but we don't really concentrate on that in this country. We don't have a, a sense in this country that it's every, it's, uh, we're all in it together. It's, it's an every man for himself philosophy that governs this country much more than most other Western democracies. Um, and that's not a good thing for a country because every country, as to every modern country, is now a quasi-socialist country. That's not a dirty word. But in America, when you say socialist, you know, most people, they don't know what it means. They just, they know it's something super bad, like <laughs> pedophilia or atheism or something like that. Mm -hmm. Just something we can't. Meanwhile, they do nothing but take money from the government. They're such hypocrites. They hate socialism, but they live on Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, farm subsidies, unemployment benefits, all this money, but they, but they hate socialism. Is it father and mother, I would yeah. say. I mean, they were both political. My father certainly did it for a living, yeah. which was different. You know, I mean, he was a newsman in the days of radio news when there was radio news at the top of the hour on every radio station and it's something we talked about in the home which i think was different than most kids i mean i think most american families if they have dinner together at all if the family's together at all you know they're probably watching tv at dinner mm -hmm. or talking about 
reality TV or whatever. Uh, the best day of my life was when I found out we don't have to go to church anymore. Yes, <laughs> I was uh, 13 years old. I, I put this in the, uh, I interviewed my mother for my religious documentary, a uh, religious, and, and um, you know, I wanted to ask her on camera because I'd never really understood this. Uh, why did we stop going to church? And why did you, Mom, never <laughs> go to why, why I knew at this point in my life I knew that she was Jewish but I never knew when I was a kid you know we were Catholics my father my sister and I were Catholics we went to church every Sunday I had to go to catechism do all that bull <laughs> my mother stayed home and I never asked why you know it was like what she had to babysit the dog <laughs> I was just so petrified about church that I wasn't thinking about anything else and I said you know why didn't you tell me when I was younger and she was like well I didn't think it was my place. You know, it's, the, the mindset back then was so different. And I was like, but you aren't Catholic. Why were you? I remember her like help, helping me with the catechism. And she said, well, you know, the way we thought back then was it's better to have some religious training than none. Right. It, you know, it doesn't matter what the religion it is, as long as you believe in nonsense of some kind. <laughs> That's what's important. It even worked into some of your act. Let's, let's memory lane this now. Oh, gosh. Yeah. I was raised Catholic formally. Although, I must say, the Jewish mind comes out, even in the Catholic system. Uh, I'll give you an example. Uh, we used to go into confession, and uh, I would bring a lawyer in with me. <laughs> That's my first, first time on TV. Yeah. That's Johnny Carson, 1982. W yeah. What was going through your mind just before? Uh, that my pants were too tight. <laughs> Were you nervous at all in that of moment? Of course. We're all nervous because we know that that's like the baccalaureate. If you don't pass that test, you do not go on. Right. You know? yeah. uh, and if you do well, you, you might have a career in show business, and you are legitimized. If you don't do well, there's really nothing for you because every other show you would do would be to build up to that show, to The Tonight Show. So, so there was a lot riding on it, but it is a piece of cake gig. I mean, compared to you, you, you've been working in clubs, you know, where the audience could be very difficult and drunk and whatever heckling, and now you're on with Johnny Carson, who set you up. You know, we found a fabulous young comedian, and you're gonna, you're gonna love him, and it's a very hard commodity, and you know all that bull. He would say every time. It was a hard commodity to find. There was a new one every week. You couldn't swing a dead cat without hitting a comic in those days. Uh, but if you did well, you know, you, you got to keep going. I mean, the, the mistake people made in that era was thinking that it made you a star. It, that, those days were over. I did 30 Tonight Shows, and people, wow. I still was not very well known until I got my own show. But it could get you your own show, The Tonight Show. But, uh, yeah, bees are dying out. I mean, it's, you know, we're, we, are, we are completely destroying the planet. I mean... Uh, Is it inevitable? Are we just doing what we're designed it's to It's not do? inevitable, but we would have to reverse it starting like yesterday, and we're not even close to doing that. Right. So, uh, you know, have I lost all hope? No. But, uh, you know, I always say it's the younger people who have to be passionate about this more than I am. I'm 57. I've had my fun with the world. When you're 25, yeah. you're the one who's going to be on the cleanup committee. You're the one who's going to be wearing a hazmat suit to go down and get the mail. Get the mail. Look at me. Right. Look at me getting the mail. Now, you got to admit, there's a little thing undignified about this episode in the White House. You have to say that. It is. But, I mean, if you looked into any single person's personal life, the way they did with Clinton's life, they would uncover something. I mean, Larry, we'd find out that you may have been married before. People cannot stand <laughs> that kind. <laughs> he pushes the button. No, I know, I know what you People getting. cannot stand that kind of scrutiny. And in our history, we never had that kind of scrutiny. When FDR was president, he was a cripple, right? They didn't even ask didn't about it. They knew it. They, they knew didn't, it, but didn't know it. Exactly. Didn't. The president's legs we're too private to talk about. Correct. We've gone from the point where the president's legs are too private to talk about <laughs> to his private parts being fully okay for the front page of the New York Times. It's not Bill Clinton who put that on the table. That's a bad choice of words. <laughs> what I'm saying... <laughs> Atlanta, hello. <laughs> you made a good point. Atlanta, hello.